uh, we are in the middle of a series that's actually lasting the entire year uh, called Threaded. And, and the purpose behind this series is for us to be able to see the big picture of, of the work of redemption through Jesus Christ that starts actually on the opening page of the Bible and carries all the way through to the very end of the Bible. And so we're reading through the Bible together as a church family. I know many of you are reading God's Word with us, and I'm excited about that. I, I know that people around the country are reading along with us, and I'm excited about that. If you've not jumped in and started reading with us, today is a good day to start. And there's a reading guide that's available out in the, uh, in the hallway area there, as well as every day on Facebook we post what reading portion we are on. And then it's not broken out day by day, but it's written on the bottom of your worship guide at the at the sermon notes as well I would encourage you with a few words here in fact I was talking with somebody a friend of mine that lives in Illinois this morning about it and he said pastor I struggle with reading I don't like reading and sometimes this portion that we're reading in the Bible it doesn't make sense to me and so I'm really struggling I'm just going to try a little bit harder and here's my words for him and my words for you I gave him two words of advice. Number one, if you don't like reading, there's a good answer these days, and it's free. If you have the internet on your computer and or your phone, all you have to do is go to the Bible app, version. You can go to the website, and almost every translation of the Bible is available for free to listen to. So listen to the Bible while you're getting ready for the day or while you're driving to work or home from work. The other thing that I encouraged him with is to grab a hold of a, of a study Bible uh, because a study Bible doesn't have so many notes that it's overwhelming, but it has enough notes that you can actually read the opening of why this book was written, when it was written, who it was written to, and then a few notes as you go along. So those two pieces of advice might be able to help you, number one, if you don't like to read, and number two, if you struggle with some of the content. So those things would be helpful to you. Also, I encouraged him to not try harder. And what I mean by that is, I don't know whether he meant it this way or not, but when we say, I'll try harder, sometimes we turn it into, I've just got to do it better. I've just got to work a little harder. And what I told him is, trust God. Trust God. So I, I, I encourage you to get into God's Word. If you haven't gotten into it, it's okay. Jump in with us now. If you miss a day, it's okay. Skip that day. Read the day that we're on. We're reading about three chapters a day, and you can pull it off. I guarantee it, if you get behind in the book of Leviticus, you won't try to catch up. <laughs> Leviticus is a little bit tough. Here's, here's the words of wisdom from my wife. She read Leviticus 1 through 3, and she said, Alan, I've, I've got the uh, kind of application for me. She said, Alan, if I was a priest, I would go for the priest in charge of the grain offering. That sounds like a much better job than the priest in charge of the other slaughtering, butchering type of offerings. We're not in Leviticus this morning, we're in Exodus this morning in, in the worship service. But before we get there, I wanted to take you to, to the jail. Uh, I want to tell you about the day I first walked into Caddo Correctional Center, the CCC. It's in Shreveport, Louisiana. Before you flip out on me, no, I didn't go in as an inmate, but I do remember the first day I walked in. I don't know whether you've been to jail or not, but I'm a little bit intimidated by it. I'd, I'd been to a prison in Memphis, Tennessee, and that went okay. But when I went to Caddo Correctional Center, it was all different. I've got all kinds of stories I'll tell you another day about my experiences at the jail. But that first day, I remember it. I walk in, and they sign me in. They find out I'm a pastor. They find out who I'm going to see, and they go, all right, here you go, buddy. You're going to go up the stairs, down the hall. You're going to don't go right. Go to the left. Turn right there at that corner. When you get there, you look for the red window uh, on the left-hand side, and you just go in there. I went, that's great. Where's the guard to go with me? There ain't no guard going with you. You're doing this by yourself. I was a little intimidated. I'm walking up the stairs. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an idiot at times. I get upstairs. I'm like, but what if I get up there, and there's an inmate loose in the hallway? I, and then I get up there, what if I make a wrong turn? What if I open a door and that's not the door I'm supposed to go into and what that door really leads to is in the cell with the inmates. What if I open the wrong door? I was a little intimidated to do this all by myself. And then the kicker, I get to the area. Do y'all remember what I said about the red window? It's on the right side. They, I mean, sorry, they said it's on the left side. So I get there Red window, but it's on the right side, not on the left side. I'm like, okay, which one is it? Do they mean right or do they mean red? Which one is it? Which way do I go? What if I open the wrong door? 
Thankfully, I went the right direction. I had the visit. I left. I was so glad to be out of there. Because I was intimidated to take that journey by myself. Our lives are not intended for us to journey by ourselves. God made us for community. God created us to be in relationship with him and with one another. That's why here at our church you'll hear us talk about hope groups. There are small groups that meet during the course of the week. If you're not in a hope group, we'd love for you to jump in one. That's why we're starting some things called D groups. They're designed to do community together, to live life together, to do it together so that we're not walking in the wilderness all by ourselves. But this morning, I want us to be reminded while God wants us to go through life with him, uh, sorry, with each other, more importantly, he wants us to go through life with him. So how do we journey through life so that we're not by ourselves, but we're with him? The account we're going to read this morning ties directly into this. If you've read this week, perhaps you know the story. If you're not, let me bring us all up to speed. Essentially, the nation of Israel had been in captivity in Egypt. God said, I'm going to use Moses and deliver you out of there. And they do. They get out. And the beginning of the book of Exodus is all about them getting out of slavery. And then the second half of Exodus is all about an experience that they have at an area called Mount Sinai. They set up camp, and there's this big mountain, and, 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 and Moses goes up on top of the mountain to get a word from God. And while he's up there, the people get very, very, very bored, I guess, and a bit antsy. The Bible tells us he's up there for 40 days and nights. They're going, uh-uh. This Moses guy doesn't know what he's doing. He brought us out into the uh, desert to starve us to death. We should have stayed in Egypt, but since he took us out of there, we need somebody to lead us further into where we're headed. So here's a great idea. Let's all get our, our jewelry, put it together, make a golden calf. We'll bow down and worship the calf because the calf is the one that brought us out of Egypt. It made no sense, but that's what they did. So now we're going to pick up the story in the book of Exodus in chapter 33, After God sends Moses back down the mountainside, finds out what they've done, punishment comes. Actually, 3,000 men perish. You can read about that in chapter 32. And then now God and Moses have a little bit of a conversation. Exodus chapter 33, verses 1 through 3. Before I read it, I want to set this up in that they're in Sinai, but they're supposed to be going to the promised land, right? Right? So that's what this conversation is about. Exodus 33, beginning in verse 1, we'll read 1, 2, and part of 3. It says this, The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites go up to a land flowing with milk and honey pause. So here's the deal. If they had just worshipped a golden calf, what would happen? God said, good news, because you have repented, I will let you go. I will send you. I will send an angel, and you'll go up there. I'll deliver you from all these people, and it'll be your land, the land of the milk and honey. That sounds good until you read the end of verse 3. The end of verse 3 says, But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. I thought my trip to the CCC by myself was bad. They were getting ready for something much worse. Because all this time God had personally guided them and went with them and was present with them and now all of a sudden everything changes and look at verse one he doesn't say my people who have been delivered out of Egypt he says the people who have been delivered out of Egypt in verse two he doesn't say I'm going to send my angel or I'm going to send myself or I'm going to go before you instead I'm going to send an angel before you it's very impersonalized this is not a good subject for the people to hear And Moses 
does not like this. The people of God don't like this. And they say, we've got to do something different. And so Moses grabs a tent. And if you've read through Exodus, the word tent of meeting, the words tent of meeting are used in two different ways. One is a personal tent of Moses, and the other is the big tabernacle that the people of Israel used. In this scenario, in chapter 33, basically, Moses grabs his personal tent and goes, that's it. i got to go see God. I'm going to take my tent of meeting. I'm going to go outside the camp. I'm going to set it up. And when I set it up, God and I are going to have a sit down, and we're going to talk about this discussion. God, how could you say that you're going to send us, but you're not going to go with us? Look at Moses' interaction with God in verse 33 as well, beginning in verse 9. It says, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. He had done this before. It's describing how this experience always went down. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud, which indicated God's presence, standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his own tent door. Thus the Lord used to meet, or speak, I should say, to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. There's familiarity with God. There's familiarity with this whole process of where Moses is going to sit and visit with God about things. Keep reading in verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, that's God. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, lest you think that Moses does the typical, unfortunate husband thing to do and check out and zone back in and go, I didn't understand what happened. If you read verse 15, you may think he had zoned out because God told him clearly, right, in verse 14, I've changed my mind, I'm going to go with you. And yet Moses has the audacity to press this a little bit further in verse 15. Moses said to God, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Like God just told him he would go with him. Why is he now saying in verse 15, but if you're not going to go with us, I don't want any part of it. Here's the reason why. You go back to verse 14. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I just use some uh, commentaries. And as I do that, I find out that you, in verse 14, when he says to God, God says, and my presence will go with you, the word you is actually singular. So Moses says, that's great that you're going with me, God, but I need you to go with us. And so in verse 15, he, he, he intercedes for the people and says, I need your presence to go with us. He goes on talking to God for, how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is this not, sorry, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight and I know your name. On your notes there, you'll see that we are to be desperate for God's presence. Desperate for God's presence. Moses says, it's not good enough, God, that you're saying you're going to go ahead, that you're going to send your angel ahead of us. You're going to clear the land of these people. You're going to do these things. You're going to give us the land. I don't care about the land, God. I care about you being with us in the land. I don't want just any old angel, I want your angel. I don't want just the people to go, I want your people to go. He's demanding and saying to God, I need your presence, we need your presence. What's God's reaction? I I read it in verse 17, let's look at it again. In verse 17, he says this, this very thing that you have spoken, Moses, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses did a very bold thing. 
He came before the, the throne of the Lord boldly and said, we need you to go with us. He was the mediator. He was the intercessory person on behalf of the people of Israel. Here's the good news, guys. You and I don't need Moses to intercede for us. We have someone that intercedes for us, and his name is Jesus. Here's the good news. You don't have to come to me uh, and set up an appointment to meet with me so that I can get you in good with God so that I can pray on your behalf. You can come and I'll pray with you. But here's the exciting thing. You can pray to him as well. So in the Old Testament, Moses does the right thing. He intercedes for the people because he's desperate for the presence of God to be with them. But the good news is because of Jesus Christ, if we've placed our faith and our trust in him, his presence is already with us. And we can pray directly to him. So I want us to see that truth as we unpack this a little bit, as we look into the New Testament to understand what it all is going to look like. I want us to think for just a minute that you and I as individuals and you and I as a church family should have the same attitude that Moses has, and that is we should be desperate for the presence of of the Lord. Let me give you a few kind of application points as it relates to that, and maybe you can associate with some of these things. I encourage us to pursue not simply the benefits of God, but pursue God himself. All too often, people want the blessings, but they don't care about the blesser. All too often, people just want life to go smoothly, but they could care less whether or not God's in the picture. They just want somebody to make things right and good in their life, and they forget that it's not about the blessings, it's about the blesser who sends those blessings. Maybe you're not following me, so let me say it again. It's not about what can I get from God, it's about I want and I need the presence of God in my life. If you were to chat with a friend and say, hey, what do you think is going to happen at the end of our lives? Do you believe in heaven? They might say yes. may not believe in Jesus, but they may say yes. And Are you going to go to heaven? Well, I sure hope so. What do they want? They don't want to be punished in hell. They just want to be in a good place called heaven. They could care less whether God's there or not. The reward of heaven is not that heaven is something special, but instead it's special because it's in the presence of God himself. You see, salvation is not about being rescued from something bad, but instead it's to be rescued from our sin and the evil associated with it so that we can be in right standing with God. It's about a relationship with God. Stop pursuing the blessings and pursue the blesser. It's, it, there's, a, there's a difference here. And by the way, when I say that, I want to be real careful. Don't think, oh, I'm supposed to pursue the blesser, and then I'm going to get everything I want anyway. So in essence, you're pursuing the blessings. No, you're pursuing God. The blessing comes from just being present with him or him being present with us. So be desperate for the presence of God. Let me use an example. Let's presume in my marriage that I want a trouble-free marriage. I want a marriage that will last forever, a marriage that doesn't end in divorce. That's a wonderful sentiment, but the reality is I shouldn't be looking for a trouble-free marriage, but instead I should look for God to be present in my marriage so that it can be all that it can be and should be for the glory of God, not just so that I get some kind of reward out of the situation. Let's pursue what God put us on this earth for, a relationship with him to bring him glory and him honor and not about us. It's not about us, it's about him. And that is the big difference whenever it comes to this idea of pursuing his presence. Now I want us to talk about what will happen as a church. All too often the church, not our church necessarily, but other churches, all of the churches, if we're not careful, we make everything about the method or, or, or the plans, or, or the style, or, or our agenda. And if we're not careful, we real quickly can do church and pull it off even if God's not present and blessing us. Guys, it's time for us to stop doing church. It's time for us to be the church. God's calling us to a mission. God's calling us to a mission to, to, to extend the blessing of God and the glory and fame and the name of Jesus Christ around the world. It's to share the good news of, the, of Jesus Christ to everybody in our sphere of influence. The only way we live out that mission is if God's presence is with us. We cannot and must not try to do it on our own. 
So don't be satisfied with the stuff. Don't be satisfied with doing church. Be satisfied with the very presence of God. Got a good friend. I don't know whether Steve might happen to listen to this message, but I've shared a little bit of his story with you. He was a roommate of mine. He's 50 years old and has a horrible prognosis on his cancer. The first couple of rounds of treatment have not been all that bad, but this last round has hit him hard. I don't know whether he'll continue with the plan or not continue with the plan. I don't know what God's intention is in this season of his life. I know I want to get up to Missouri to see him before anything inevitably might happen that would prevent me from seeing him. What's been a joy to see in his life is the thing that is pushing him through a horrible prognosis is that God is present in his life and guiding him and helping him in spite of this horrible cancer that has ravaged his body. So guys, whether it's that or something else, don't be satisfied with just kind of cruising through life and everything being okay in life, but instead be satisfied only as we seek the presence of God. Now let's go to the second one. Not only should we be desperate for God's presence, we also should long for God's glory. Look at chapter 33, verses 18 through 23. God's just told Moses that he'll go with them. God go, Moses says, hey God, while we're doing this, let me take it up another notch. Verse 18, Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses goes, God, I, I'm glad your presence is going with us. In addition to that, God, I need to see, I, I want to see. Please show me your glory. What is God's glory? God's glory is his significance. It's, it's his power. It's his importance. It's his essential being. It's who he is. It's his vibrancy of, of all that God is. It, and oftentimes we picture it in this big fire or, or light because that's all we know to kind of describe God. Moses said, I want to see or I want to experience your presence. I don't want to just know your presence is there. I want to experience it. I want to see it. I want to see what your glory is all about. Please, God, would you let me see it? And God answers him in verse 19. He says three different ways that he's going to show Moses his, his, his glory. Verse 19, here they are. First, I will make all my goodness pass before you. In other words, I'm going to show you a glimpse of my glory. That's the first way. The second way, he says, I'm going to proclaim before you my name, the Lord. God's glory is wrapped up in who God is, and he's going to show him who he is and tell him who he is by sharing his name with him. The third way that he says there is also in verse 19, and in verse 19, God says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. The third way God's glory would be seen is in God's sovereign grace. So, that's lived out. Verse 19 is lived out in a few ways. Verses 20 through 23, we see how God put him in this little cleft of a rock, kind of shielded his eyes a little bit. He kind of saw a little bit of the glimpse of the glory of God, his goodness as he walked by, literally. The second way, we're going to look at it in a minute in verse 30, chapter 34, where we see about the name of God. And the third way, that sovereign grace, they've just experienced it. The nation of Israel had worshipped a golden calf, and God said, I'm still choosing to love you, not because of what you've done for me but because of my grace. I can show mercy on whom I want to show mercy. I can show grace on whom I want to show grace. It's God's sovereign grace that displays his glory to the world. So we see that, that we should long for God's glory just as Moses did. Keep reading with me now as God shows him his name. Chapter 34. Chapter 34. We'll read verses 5 through 9. It says, The Lord descended in the cloud... 
and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Here's the name of the Lord, verses 6 and 7. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord. This is God himself saying this about him. This is not Moses. This is not a commentator. This is not a man. This is God himself. He says, this is who I am, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head because now he has seen the glory of God. He bows his head toward the earth and he worshiped. When you see the glory of God, you worship. And it says, and he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. So God's presence is not only there, his presence is literally felt and seen and experienced. I want us to unpack verses 6 and 7. One of the mo most famous verses in all of the Bible. It's repeated over a dozen time, times in the New Testament and Old Testament combined. Let's look at these phrases and find the comfort that we see in who God is. It says that he's merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The goodness of God comes to us not because we deserve it, but because he freely gives it to us. He lavishes his love upon us through his patience, his love, and his kindness and faithfulness to us. God, in fact, is defined by this characteristic that he is a God of steadfast love. The Hebrew word is chesed. He is full of a love that never ends. It's ongoing. It's not contingent upon what we do. It's because of who he is. And our God is a gracious God. Because in spite of our sin, it says there in verse 7, that he is forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. But then we see a little bit of a scary end of verse 7. And in our hope group this week, we read verses 6 and 7, and we're like, we like that verse, right? It's pretty cool until you get to the end of verse 7, and you're like, hold up, God. What do you mean by the ending of verse 7? It says this, but who will, talking about himself, will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. What's that all about? I, if you don't mind, I want to read Exodus chapter 20. You may want to jot it down. To get its full context of what is meant here, we, I think we need to see Exodus 20 verses 4 through 6. Because in Exodus 20 verses 4 through 6, it's the command, the Ten Commandments, including don't build a graven image. Well, what's just happened? The nation of Israel had built that graven image in, in, in chapter 32, and then now God is saying, hey, I'm going to visit the iniquities of, of, of your sins to the third and fourth generations. So to get the full picture, I want to read Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. God says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or of anything that's in heaven above or that's on, in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now listen to this. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. So one aspect I think we need to see is this. He, I think, is specifically talking to those who hate him, that are not following him, the, 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 not just people that are asking God to forgive them of their sins, and now God goes, too bad, I'm going to visit it down to your third, fourth, fifth generation, it's just how it goes. No, I think it has its fullest context when we see that God says, for those who hate me. But what we do need to see at the same time is that the consequences of our sin does have a ripple down effect, right? Sometimes there are sins or choices that families make and not necessarily that their kids are guilty of that sin necessarily, but they are impacted by the guilt of their family. The consequences are there. Let me give one prime example. The guy's name is Adam. The lady's name is Eve. Their sin travels down the line, right? So don't read in chapter 34, verse 7, that God is vengeful and he wants to strike us down. If I sin, then he's going to kill all my kids and kids underneath them and them and them. But instead, it's this idea that we have to be careful about how we raise our kids and how we make choices because they do have consequences. They will have consequences because we live in a fallen world. 
But we must remember that God is capable of forgiving sins because he says that time and time again in verse 6 and verse 7 there. Whenever I think about the glory of God that's described in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, I see that God is a God of holy love. Uh, He's a God of holy love. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Because God is holy, his righteousness requires punishment for sin. At the same time, because God is love, his mercy provides forgiveness. So I want to unpack something real quick for you. The Bible says that because sin entered the world with Adam and Eve, that sin just carries its way on down the line. The Bible says all of us are sinners. The Bible says that because of our sins, we are separated forever from a holy, perfect God because he is holy and he can have nothing to do with sin. Sin has to be judged. Sin has to be punished. Sin has to be atoned for. And so in the Old Testament, time and time again, we're reading about how a sacrifice is made and that sacrifice is representative of of the sin committed by the people and their sins can be forgiven because of the sacrifice that's that's given. But the truth of the matter is this, ultimately the sacrifice is Jesus Christ himself. The Son of God, fully God, fully man, came and lived a perfect life, lived a life we cannot live. He took the punishment that you and I deserve because God is a holy God and sin must be punished. He died in our place, but the amazing good news is that because uh, he is the God of love, that, that, that God allows Jesus' righteousness to be given to us whenever we place our faith and our trust and repent of our sins based on what Jesus Christ did on the cross and his resurrection three days later. So our God is a God that is holy. Sin must be paid for. And yet, at the same time, he's a God of love. His mercy provides forgiveness. I want us to think for just a minute about some lessons that we can learn from this idea of Moses that is longing for God's glory. You and I should long for God's glory. I mean, we were made for God's glory. We were made to bring him glory, to bring him honor, to bring him worship. Literally, we worship him with our words, with our thoughts, with our actions, with our attitudes, with with our obedience. We worship him in so many ways. We're made for his glory. If we want to experience God's glory, then we understand that we are made to worship him. And that the reason we go out and tell others, the reason we go out and tell all nations about the hope that's found in Jesus Christ is because they don't know how to worship God because they haven't experienced his forgiveness yet, and we extend his glory by worshiping him and pointing others to him so that they might worship him as well. Guys, it's time for us to long for God's glory. Along those same lines, I would encourage you to be really careful about being too comfortable with God. God is not your homeboy. God is not your best friend. He is your friend, but he's 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 not your boy. He is your God who is to be revered and feared and respected and honored and glorified. Don't become complacent with God. Don't go, I've read his word, I know the story, I don't need to read anymore. No, we need to dive in deep into his glory and allow his word and his truth to transform us, which further reflects his glory. Because if we become complacent, we don't fully understand God's glory and are unable to reflect it to a world that needs to see it as well. And I say it's time for us to long to see the glory of God rain down on this place. It's time for us to not be satisfied with the world as we see it, that's infested and infected by sin, but instead we want God's name to be proclaimed around the world so that all people would worship him for who he is. Our desire should be to want to see our neighbors and our co-workers and our family members and and people we meet on the street, we would want to see, see them come to a salvation of who Jesus Christ is. So let's pray for God's glory to be demonstrated through our lives so that others would come to know him as well. I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes to wrap this all up. It's found there on your third note on your your sheet. It says this, the presence and glory of God gives us hope for life's journey. And here's what I mean by that. The people of 
Israel had been through an amazing journey. They had been enslaved in Egypt. They had been miraculously delivered by God. They got out to the wilderness. They began to grumble and say, God, I don't know what this is about. And then God rains down manna, whatever that is, and feeds them for 40 years. They experience all this craziness. They worship a golden calf. They get forgiven. They get punished. They get promised the promised land. All of these things happen. And the way they could keep pressing forward is by having the presence and glory of God be their hope on their journey, literally, through life. You and I, we have quite the journey in life as well. I don't know whether you're at an up or a down or if you're somewhere in between, but as we journey through life, the only hope we have is found in the presence and glory of God in our lives and let's trust in him. If you read the book of Exodus, you may have wondered at the last, why in the world does God spend 723 chapters talking about the building of the tabernacle? You're like, it's only 40 chapters long, but it feels like it's about that long, right? Like, I get it. I get it. I'm not a seamstress. I don't understand this stuff. But here is the deal. The tabernacle is built because God's going to move in to the tabernacle. He's going to dwell in its presence, and they're going to see God's glory. And so it had to be made a special way so that his glory could be seen and experienced. Flip with me to the very last page of Exodus. I promise I'm almost there. We're going to read verses 34 through 38. This is after the, the, the tabernacle is opened and, and beginning to be used. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, which is also the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God's glory was so overwhelming he couldn't go in. Verse 36, throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they would not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the people of Israel throughout all their journeys. As the people of Israel journeyed through life, They journeyed through the power and glory of the presence of God. You and I need that same thing in our lives. The good news is you don't have to follow the instructions to do the tabernacle, but instead the ultimate tabernacle came. The ultimate tabernacle of Jesus Christ who came to dwell among us. Listen to the words of John found in John chapter 1 verse 14. It says, and the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt. The word dwelt means tabernacled. So it says the word became flesh and tabernacled among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth. Because of the work of Jesus Christ we've experienced the glory of God. We have access to the father and a lifestyle of following him in his presence and his glory helps us have the only hope that really matters in life. So this morning have you placed your faith your trust and your hope in the name of Jesus Christ? Have you received the forgiveness of your sins, not because of something you do or you try harder, but instead because of what he has done on your behalf? If not, would today be the day of salvation? For those of us that have experienced God's goodness and his faithfulness and have been um, grafted into God's family, let's walk through life with the only hope that really matters, and that's the hope that's found in the presence and glory of Jesus Christ. And then let's go out and declare to the nations the glory of Christ. Let me pray for us.